told I got 10 measly minutes. But just in case, I bought 13 hours worth of information. I also came with a message, a message for the president, a message that is loud and clear, a message that doesn't mince words. Well, <laughs> that's not exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> However, I think he may have distilled my 13-hour speech into three words. <laughs> the message for the president is that no one person gets to decide the law. No one person gets to decide your guilt or innocence. My question my question to the president was about more than just killing Americans on American soil. My question was about whether presidential power has limits. Lincoln put it well when he wrote, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man, give him power. President Obama, who seemed, once upon a time, to respect civil liberties, has become the president who signed a law allowing for indefinite detention of an American citizen. Indeed, a law that allows an American citizen to be sent to Guantanamo Bay without a trial. Now, President Obama defends his signing of this bill by stating that he has no intention of detaining an American citizen without a trial. Likewise, he defended possible targeted drone strikes on Americans by indicating that he had no intention of doing so. Well, my 13-hour filibuster was a message to the president. Good intentions are not enough. The presidential oath of office states, I will protect, preserve, and defend the Constitution. It doesn't say, well, I intend to when it's convenient. Mr. President, good intentions are not enough. We want to know, will you or won't you defend the Constitution? Eisenhower wrote, how far can you go without destroying from within what you are trying to defend from without. If we destroy our enemy but lose what defines our freedom in the process, have we really won? If we allow one man to charge Americans as enemy combatants and indefinitely detain or drone them, then what exactly is it that our brave young men and women are fighting for? Montesquieu wrote that there can be no liberty if you combine the executive and the legislative branches. Likewise, there can be no justice if you combine the executive and the judicial branch. We separated arrest from accusation and trial and verdict for a reason. When Lewis Carroll's white queen shouts, sentence first, verdict afterwards, the reader's response is supposed to be, but that would be absurd. In our country, the police can arrest, but only your peers can convict. We prize our Bill of Rights like no other country. Our Bill of Rights is what defines us. It's what makes us exceptional. To those who would dismiss this debate as frivolous, I say, tell that to the heroic young men and women who sacrificed their limbs and lives. Tell that to the 6,000 parents of kids who died as American soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Tell them the Bill of Rights is no big deal. Tell it to Sergeant J.D. Williams, who's one of my neighbors. He lives in Auburn, Kentucky, a few miles from me. He sacrificed himself to save his fellow soldiers. Tell J.D., who lost both legs and an arm, tell him his sacrifice was great, but that we had to suspend the Bill of Rights he fought for. I don't think so. The filibuster was about drones, but also about much more. Do we have a Bill of Rights? Do we have a Constitution? And will we defend it? In his farewell speech in 1989, Reagan said, as government expands, liberty contracts. He was right. Government cannot give us our liberty. Our rights come from our Creator. But as government grows, liberty becomes marginalized. The collective takes precedent over the individual. Freedom shrinks. And our government today is larger than it has ever been in our history. Everything that America has been, everything we ever wished to be, is now threatened by the notion that you can have something for nothing that you can have your cake and eat it too, that you can spend a trillion dollars every year that you don't have. The President seems to think that we can keep adding to a $16 trillion debt. The President seems to think that the country can continue to borrow $50,000 a second. The President just believes we just need to squeeze more money out of those who are working. He's got it exactly backwards. I'm here to tell you that what we need to do is keep more money in the pockets of those who earned it. Look at how ridiculous Washington politicians have behaved over this sequester. The president did a big, oh, woe is me, over a trillion dollar sequester that he endorsed and he signed into law. Some Republicans joined him. But the sequester didn't even cut any spending. It just slows the rate of growth of government. Even with the sequester, the federal government will grow over $7 trillion over the next decade. Only in Washington can a $7 trillion increase in spending be called a cut. Now, the president, the president's trying to step up. He's trying to do his fair share. After the sequester was announced, he said he's going to stop the White House tours for school children. <laughs> they had to do this because the, these cuts were imposed by the sequester. But meanwhile, within a few days, the president finds an extra $250 million to send to Egypt. You know, the country where mobs attacked our embassy, burned our flag, and chanted death to America, he found an extra $250 million to reward them. You know, the country whose president recently stood by his spiritual leader who called for death to Israel and all who support her. I say not one penny more to countries that are burning our flag. But I do want to help the President. I have a few suggestions for him. I'm sorry I couldn't have lunch with him today. Maybe he'll be able to see this later on C-SPAN. So what I asked the President, if he wants to let the school children back in the White House, what about the three million dollars that we spend studying monkeys on math? Does it really take $3 million to discover that monkeys, like humans, act crazy on meth? 
Mr. President, what about the $300,000 for a robotic squirrel? Now, they wanted to study whether a squirrel that doesn't wag its tail, whether it will be bitten by a rattlesnake. <laughs> Only problem, they couldn't find a real squirrel to volunteer not to wag its tail. <laughs> but I can tell you the bottom line for the $300,000 question, a rattlesnake will bite the you-know-what out of a squirrel not wagging its tail. <laughs> Mr. President, maybe we could have cut the robotic squirrel before we went to White House tours. Now, for any of you college students looking for jobs, Uncle Sam's got a job for you. The pay's $5,000, all expenses paid. The study is in Hawaii. But the requirements are onus, on, onerous. Only a few could qualify. You have to like food. The study is to develop a menu for when we colonize Mars. I'm not making this up. Guess what a bunch of college students came up with for the menu? Pizza. You could cut one of these programs and return to letting the school children come to the White House. This government's completely out of control. We desperately need a new course and new leadership. The path forward for the Republican Party is rooted in the respect for the Constitution and respect for the individual. Part of that respect is allowing our Americans to freely exercise one of their most basic rights, the right to bear arms. But you can't protect the Second Amendment if you don't protect the Fourth Amendment. If we are not secure in our homes, if we are not secure in our persons and our papers, can we really believe that the right to bear arms will be secure? We need, we need to jealously guard all our liberties. The Facebook generation can detect falseness and hypocrisy a mile away. I know, I have kids. <laughs> they are the core, though, of the Leave Me Alone Coalition. They doubt Social Security will be there for, him, for them. They worry about jobs and money and rent and student loans. They want leaders that won't feed them a line of crap or sell them short. They aren't afraid of individual liberty. Ask the Facebook generation whether we should put a kid in jail for the nonviolent crime of drug abuse, and you'll hear a resounding no. <laughs> Ask the Facebook generation if they want to bail out too big to fail banks with their tax dollars, and you'll hear a hell no. There is nothing conservative about bailing out Wall Street. Likewise, there is nothing progressive about billion-dollar loans to millionaires to build solar panels. The Republican Party has to change by going forward to the classical and timeless ideas enshrined in our Constitution. When we understand that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, then we'll become the dominant national party again. It's time for us to revive Reagan's law. For liberty to expand, government must shrink. For For the economy to grow, government must get out of the way. This month, I will propose a five-year balanced budget. My budget eliminates the Department of Education. <laughs> a 
and devolves power and money back to the states where they belong. My five-year budget will create millions of jobs by cutting the corporate income tax in half, by creating a flat personal income tax of 17 percent, and cutting the regulations that are strangling American business. The only stimulus ever proven to work is leaving more money in the hands of those who earned it. The Constitution must be our guide. For conservatives to win nationally, we must stand for something. We must stand on principle. We must stand for something so powerful and so popular that it brings together people from the left and the right and the middle. We need a Republican Party that shows up on the south side of Chicago and shouts at the top of our lungs, we are the party of jobs and opportunity. The GOP is the ticket to the middle class. The GOP of old has grown stale and moss-covered. I don't think we need to name any names, do we? Our party is encumbered by an inconsistent approach to freedom. The new GOP will need to embrace liberty in both the economic and the personal sphere. If we're going to have a Republican Party that can win, liberty needs to be the backbone of the GOP. We must, we must have a message that is broad, our vision must be broad, and that vision must be based on freedom. There are millions of Americans, young and old, native and immigrant, black, white, and brown, who simply seek to live free, to practice their religion, free to choose where their kids go to school, free to choose their own health care, free to keep the fruits of their labor, free to live without government constantly being on their back. I will stand for them. I will stand for you. I will stand for our prosperity and our freedom. And I ask everyone who values liberty to stand with me. Thank you. God bless America. Thank you.